The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How quickly things change. Last week, we heard Peter's confession. Right? Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter boldly said, the first one, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, yeah, you're right, Peter. And on this rock, on the confession, of, on the rock of this confession, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom to go and build, right? Preach law and gospel. We ended at verse 20 of chapter 16 of Matthew last week. We pick up at verse 21. It's the same conversation. They're in the same spot. How quickly things change. From Peter, whose name means rock, to giving this bold confession which Jesus calls a rock on which he builds, Peter is now called just moments later, the stumbling block. <laughs> He's a stumbling block to Jesus. And why? Because Peter hears from Jesus something he doesn't want to hear. Jesus says that, you know what? I'm going to tell you guys why I came. I, I want it to be so clear why the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that Peter just confessed so boldly and, and accurately why he came. He wasn't here to be this Messiah, this, 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 this uh, Messiah to set up this earthly kingdom and restore power and glory here on earth to the kingdom of, of Israel. He wasn't here to bring earthly peace and prosperity for his people. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day be raised to life. Jesus says, my reason for coming, the reason the Messiah was sent, why the Son of the living God is here, is to suffer and die <laughs> at the hands of my enemies. And Peter doesn't want to hear about that. Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Right? You can almost picture Peter getting up in Jesus' face with a finger. and What are you talking about, Jesus? What is this death thing you're talking about in suffering? I will never let that happen, Jesus. That will not happen. Literally in the Greek it says, Lord, have mercy on you, Jesus. May this never happen to you. Jesus describes the problem here. What's going on inside of Peter? He says, Peter, you don't have the things of God in mind. You don't have the concerns of God in mind. You have the concerns of men. And what are the concerns of men? They want life to be good. <laughs> right? Isn't that what our life is usually about? Isn't that what the world tells us? The purpose of life is to find happiness. Pursue wealth. Seek earthly peace. That 
Joy is found in your accomplishments, in what you do. Finding glory in the things of this life. That's the concerns of men. That's the concern of Peter here. He, he wants an earthly kingdom. He wants power. He wants earthly peace. He wants prosperity. And he thinks maybe this Messiah is the one who's going to bring it to us. He doesn't have in mind the things of God because the things of God, Jesus says, are suffering and death, pain and torture, difficulty and sadness. And so Jesus knows why he has come. Jesus knows what he is facing. And here at this time it says that from now on he's going to unveil this to his disciples more and more because he wants them to be ready. He doesn't want them caught off guard when they go to Jerusalem finally. And, and there he is arrested and put on trial and put to death. But right now his disciples don't want to hear any of this. And so Jesus says, Peter, get behind me. Get back where you belong. I mean, Peter forgets who he is. He's, he's not the teacher. <laughs> he's not the leader in this little group. He's the disciple. And a disciple is a student. A disciple is a follower. And what Peter is doing here is he's putting, him out front of, he's putting himself out front of Jesus and saying, Jesus, I know the better way. I, I know. No, 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 we're not going to talk about suffering and death. We're going to talk about good things. Happy things. Right? And Jesus, in turn, rebukes Peter and says, get behind me. Get back where you belong. And you catch what he calls him? He says, get behind me, Satan. Because Jesus knows who's at work behind this words of, these words of Peter. Jesus knows why this huge shift from just him saying, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God, to saying, Jesus, no, you'll never, that'll never happen to you, right? It's Satan. He recognizes the voice of Satan through Peter. And the, Satan wants nothing more than for Jesus to give up. And to say, oh, you don't want to go to that cross. You don't want to suffer and die. There's got to be a different way, Jesus. Maybe Jesus was remembering back to the temptations of Satan in the wilderness. Right when he began his ministry. Remember the, 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 the one temptation? Jesus, look at all of these things. Look at all of this land. I will give it all to you. Satan says, as if it's his to give anyways, but I'll give it all to you if you just bow down to me. Give up on why you came. Forget about all that suffering and dying stuff and just have an earthly kingdom here, right? You, you've got a lot of power. You, got, you can do miracles. You could probably gain quite the following. You could, you could bring peace and prosperity to these people. You could make heaven on earth here for them if you wanted to, right? Give up on that suffering and dying thing. Jesus hears the voice of Satan through Peter. And he says, get behind me, Satan. The temptation, the stumbling block on his way to that cross, on the way to that suffering and death that Jesus knows has to happen. This has to be the way it is. Jesus must go to that cross. He knows that. He wants his disciples to know that. So he says, get behind me. And this rebuke of Peter is, a, is probably one that you need to hear every once in a while, too. Because don't we like to come to God and tell him how things should go <laughs> and how our life should be and how the world should be, right? And what do we seek after? Earthly peace, prosperity, a trouble-free life. Right? We're not much, di much different than much of the world around us, right? Right? So much of our lives are trying to be free of suffering, free of pain, free of difficulty, right? We'd love a better life here on this earth, but that is not promised. In fact, Jesus says, when you're one of my disciples, you will have trouble. He guarantees it. How often we need to hear this rebuke, too, when we take the position of a leader and get in front of Jesus and say, Jesus, this is the way we should go. This is the way things should happen. To hear Jesus rebuke, get behind me. Get back where you belong. Get back in the position where you belong, Peter, and you, and me. And what 
does that look like? What does getting behind Jesus look like? Well, he tells us here. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus says, to get behind me means to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Well, what does this mean? Uh, it's really important for us to understand this. Uh, because really what this is, what Jesus describes here in one sentence, the life behind him as one of his disciples, is really our entire Christian life between the moment that we were called to faith by the work of the Holy Spirit, and when, that moment when we will reach the goal of our faith, the salvation of our soul, and we'll get to be in heaven, and all, that, all this will be gone, right? But every moment in between is what Jesus is describing here. Taking up the cross, denying ourselves, and following him. That is the Christian life. And, and friends, if we miss out on what that means, if we don't grasp what Jesus is talking about here, what the life of a disciple looks like, I guarantee it's going to be a life of frustration and a lack of confidence as you face life and a lack of joy and peace. If we don't grasp what it means to take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow Jesus. This is the heart of our lives, our Christian lives. So we have to understand this. So what does it mean? What is Jesus describing to us? What a life behind him looks like? Well, some would say that, you know, when we use that word cross, right, it's the difficulties and the sufferings and the troubles that we have to go through in this life, right? So maybe you've heard someone say, or maybe you've said it before, right? You've got a, a chronic illness or struggle in your life where it's your cross to bear. This is my cross to bear in life, right? A, 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 this disease I got to deal with or, or maybe depression that I struggle with, right? Um, or um, a, a bad relationship that I've got to just deal with and get through and, and make the best of. This is the cross I have to bear. I'm not convinced that what, that's what Jesus means here. Because Christians aren't the only ones who have to go through those difficulties, right? Unbelievers have chronic illnesses too. They're not the cross that Jesus can be talking about here. They don't follow him. Other people, unbelievers, people who don't follow Jesus, they, they too have trouble in relationships. So I'm not quite sure that's the crosses to bear that Jesus is talking about, just the troubles we all have in this life. Sometimes these crosses will be described as, well, anything that we endure and have to go through, any suffering that we, we, we struggle with in this life because we're a follower of Christ, because we're his disciple. So for example, we're called to share our faith with other people. We're called to preach the good news, right? to tell other people about the Savior, and that always doesn't go real well, right? You can be insulted, you can be persecuted, you can be rejected, and some will say, well, that's the cross you have to bear as a Christian. Because you are a Christian, you get, you're going to get rejected. That's a cross to bear. Or uh, another example might be, uh, a, a Christian cross might be that you know, we sacrifice to send our kids to Christian schools. Because they cost a little bit more money than the public schools. There's tuition to pay. But it's a cross that's worth bearing. It's a sacrifice worth making so that my children can hear God's word every day in school. Or, we want to give generously. We want to support the work of the gospel through our church and our church body so that more people can hear the good news of their Savior. And that means sacrifice, right? Right? That means a little less that I have to, to meet all my needs, right? It's a cross that I bear as a Christian that I've got to bear under, that I've got less money to deal with and work with. Sometimes that's how these crosses are described as well. Things that we go through in life that we have to endure, struggles that we have because we're a follower of Christ. But you know, I'm not totally convinced that's what Jesus is talking about either. I think it might be something else. So what is the cross that Jesus is talking about that we are called to take up? What are we talking about here? That, 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 uh, the, the cross that we have to deal with and, and deny ourselves and follow him. What if it's not about us at all? 
What if it's not about the struggles that I have to endure? What if it's not about the suffering that I endure in this life just because I live in a sinful world or, or because I'm a Christian? What if it's actually about his suffering? What if the cross is actually not about what I do and what I have to go through, but about what Jesus went through and has already done for me? Wouldn't that change everything? Right? If the cross we're told to take up is not about us, but it's really about Jesus, If that cross really is his cross and what that cross means for us. The cross means a lot to us as Christians, doesn't it? It is a symbol of everything that we hold dear and treasure. But you know what the cross really is, right? (laughs) It's an instrument of torture and death. 2,000 years ago, the cross was not beloved. (laughs) The cross was looked at as something you want to avoid at all costs. (laughs) Because it was the Romans' favorite way to make you suffer and put you to death. The most awful way that they had. Because what it meant was, is you you were hung onto a cross for a crime that you committed to make an example of you. They put you on a cross in a place where many people would be passing by because they wanted you to to show you don't mess with the Romans. And that death was not quick and painless. It was long. It was painful. They hung you there by nails, usually, through the hands and through the feet. And you'd hang, right? And you can't breathe. And so what do you got to do? you got to pull yourself up, right, to, to try to get some, some air into your lungs, some oxygen, right? And you pull up on those nails. And before you're even hung on that cross, you're, you've been flogged, which means your back is completely ripped up, shredded. And that cross is not a nice, smooth, polished cross that we usually have in our homes, right? <laughs> it was rough timber. And so as you pulled up to get some breath, Think about what that did on your back. And it lasted hours. And sometimes days. This painful, slow death. That's what the cross is. It's a symbol of torture. Absolute pain and agony and suffering and death. And why would we hold a cross to be such... A symbol of comfort. Because we know what Jesus' cross means for us. That Jesus was willing to go to that cross, resolutely setting out for Jerusalem to allow himself to be handed over and to suffer and to be placed on that cross, not because of anything he had ever done. His death is the only innocent death ever in the history of the world. The only person who's never deserved to die goes to that cross and suffers the most agonizing, torturous death on earth that could be imagined at that time. But even more than that, it wasn't just the physical pain Jesus was enduring on that cross, but on that cross he suffered hell. The torment, the spiritual torment for every sin ever committed As he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Left all alone to die for you and for me. So that he could cry out, it is finished, it is done, it is complete. All sins have been paid for. Sinful man has been reconciled to a holy God. All done. Friends, that's why the cross is so beautiful to us. That's why we look at that cross and it's nothing but blood and pain and agony and suffering. But yet for us, it's joy and peace and forgiveness and life. That's why the cross means so much to us. 
And what if that's the cross Jesus wants us to pick up and follow? A cross not of suffering, but a cross of joy. A cross not of death, but a cross of life. A, a, a cross that assures us that all is done. That as I follow Jesus through this life, it's all about what he has done for me. That, that my cross that I carry through this life is not just about me enduring life's troubles and suffering through this and enduring it to get to heaven. That's my cross. But my cross is living in what Christ has already done for me. So what does that look like? If this is about Jesus and not about me, think about the struggles we go through in this life. Think about the troubles we have in relationships. That's not the cross. The cross we have to bear is to live in peace, in forgiveness, in compassion that God has first shown to us at the cross. Right? Or as we think about sacrificing to give, to give generously, to, to send our kids to Christian day schools, or, or to give to support the work. That, that's not my cross to bear, is that I have to give. My cross is that I've already been given everything. That sets me free to give. To give generously and willingly. Because I already have everything in Christ. But the cross that I bear in this life as I follow Jesus is not about enduring persecution or insults or ridicule for sharing my faith with somebody else. But the cross I carry is the cross of life for all people that I can't help but want to share with all people. Friends, what if that's the cross we're called to take up and follow Jesus with? The cross of everything that he already gives to us and entrusts to us and shares with us by his grace. Wouldn't that change everything? And how you look at your lives, how you look at the struggles you go through, as you look at the, the problems that you have to deal with, that it's not about you. It's all about Christ and what he does for you and gives you through that cross you are blessed to carry. But this is difficult, isn't it? This is not an easy thing. I'm not saying that, hey, now you've got the cross of Christ and life is great, right? No, because life is hard. And life is a struggle. There are many things that we must go through in this life. And that's why Jesus says we've got to continue to deny ourselves. Deny ourselves. Deny that sinful flesh daily that wants to, again, get in front of Jesus and tell him the way things should go. Right? To deny ourselves that wants to live for me and my selfishness. To deny myself that sinful flesh that wants to avoid conflict. Avoid having tough conversations. Avoid the sacrifice of giving because it feels like that would just hurt too much. Right? To deny that sinful flesh, and again to go back to that cross, and see the peace and the forgiveness that I have there. That's how I deny myself. It's all back to Christ and all that he's done for me to pick up that cross of Christ again and to follow in his way. Because that's where Jesus says real life is found. He says in verse 25, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What Jesus is saying is that when you take up that cross, when you deny yourself, that's where real life is found. Not living, in yourself, not living for yourself anymore, but living for God, living for the one you follow, and living for others. That when life stops being about me and serving myself and only looking out for myself and my own uh, joy and my own happiness and my own peace and my own accomplishments and glory here on earth, when my life stops think, being about all those things, and instead, my peace and my joy are found in Jesus and in the glory that waits for me that he promises me through that cross, absolutely everything changes. That's where real life is found. 
a life set free of striving and working, a life lived in peace and in joy and in the accomplishments of Christ for me. To live this life in the knowledge that eternal life is mine. To take up that cross, deny myself, and follow him. Well, friends, this is hard. This is the Christian life, isn't it? Every moment between when you were called to faith through the gospel by the Holy Spirit to when you reach the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Here's your life. <laughs> in between, in the struggle, taking up that cross of Christ, denying yourself, following him. And that's why what we have here is so important. We don't struggle alone. We don't have to struggle alone. Jesus doesn't want us to struggle alone. First and foremost, we look to him. We fall on our knees in repentance, just like Jeremiah, for the times that we have complained, for the times that we have called out to God and said, why am I suffering, right? The things should be a different way, right? Make my life better here on earth, God. Fix all my problems. Repent, just like Jeremiah, and rely again on the strength of the Lord. His promise is that he is with you. He is there. You carry that assurance of your salvation in that cross. And along with all of his promises, he gives us family. He gives us brothers and sisters. That as Paul wrote in our lesson from Romans, in view of God's mercy, we get to encourage one another. We get to serve one another. We get to remind each other who we are. <laughs> that we are blood-bought souls of Christ. Right? That we are heirs of eternal life. Right? And until that comes, we're cross-bearers. We continue to remind each other to get behind Jesus, where you belong. We continue to encourage each other and spur one another on toward love and good deeds, as, as Jesus calls us to. We get to continue to preach this word of God to one another as we continue to ask each other the questions and, and pose the questions to each other that Jesus does at the end. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone gain in exchange for their soul? They're rhetorical questions. The answer is nothing, right? Why would I want to give up my eternal life and my forgiveness and my peace in Christ and this cross and everything that that means for the things of this life? For my own pursuit of happiness and, and peace in this life or accomplishments and wealth, I, why would I want to ever give that up? We get to continue, friends, to remind each other, take up that cross. Find peace and forgiveness and joy and life in Jesus and what he has already done for you. Deny yourself. See that sinful flesh crucified at the cross, brought to life through that cross, the promise of an eternal life together waiting. Dear friends, let's struggle together. Right? Let's go through this life and encourage each other to be cross bearers, to deny ourselves to rely on Jesus alone, to find our hope and our joy in him alone. Let's struggle through life together. Let's encourage one another till we get to that place where we will get to be together forever. But until then, continue to focus on that cross, that instrument of death, but for us, that instrument of life and peace and forgiveness. Take up that cross and go and follow God will grant that you the strength. Amen. Please stand.